and not, not the, at that point, our Finnish leader said, okay, it's enough. We take the herd, but we uh, survive as a sovereign nation. Mm. Unfortunately, at this point, gone and went with Ukraine. We sacrificed. It's it's a failed state. We sacrificed. We sacrificed Ukrainians for a cause which I cannot understand. But the point is that we had two bloody wars with Russians, and then 80 years of prosperous uh, uh, coexistence. 80 years. Really. Yeah. Well, the, the, well with. Um, uh, a little over 50 years with the, uh, the the second greatest superpower in the world, the Soviet Union. And people said, you cannot make agreements with Russia. Bullshit. You cannot live in peace with Russia. Bullshit. You cannot live in prosperous relationship with Russia. Bullshit. On Monday, July 1st, Finland's parliament approved unanimously a brand new military treaty with the US, granting the US, not NATO, unprecedented military rights to station 15 bases in Finland right next to Russia's northwestern border. What is happening here? How did we go from Finnish neutrality to unfettered US base building in less than two years? I know we have talked about this before here, but it is a monumental shift in European security structure that deserves a lot of attention. To help make sense of it, I reached out to Tuomas Malinen, who's an associate professor of economics at the University of Helsinki and the CEO and the chief economist of GNS Economics, a macroeconomic consultancy firm. Now, while Tuomas is usually talking about economics, he also comments on geopolitics and foreign policy. Um, he does so on Twitter X, where I discovered him and where I thought his, uh, his uh, Twitter tweets were quite brilliant. So I reached out to him to discuss this today. Tuomas, thanks for coming online. Well, I'm pleased to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, no, thank you for actually taking the time because I, uh, I, I just for the first time downloaded and looked at this uh, security agreement that is now the law of the land. Um, or let me put it another way, mm. your law of the land is out and in 15 places in, in Finland, uh, now US law applies and US personnel doesn't have to pay taxes, US personnel um, can import and export whatever they want. Uh, they are not under the jurisdiction of Finland. If anyone commits a crime, mm. then it's the US uh, authorities uh, <laughs> responsible and the, these forces can they do now do in this uh, in these areas, whatever they want militarily and, and militarize mm. uh, that place. Thomas, why did that happen? Well, actually, um, for quite some time, we have the uh, center-right party or, or Kokomus here, who has been pushing for this a strong alliance with Russia. I was actually uh, kind of a background, well, not kind of, but actually a background economist and a friend of our current um, a minister of foreign affairs elena uh, elena valtonen for several years so i was i was very close in the um, of the inner circle of kokomus and there it kind of became clear that uh, uh, the kokomus party is, is is in its heart there is well there's no other way to put it but it's russophobic so they fear russians and for some reason, which which r remain unclear to, clear to me, they, they they think U.S. as the uh, something of a knight in the in the shining armor in this situation. While if we look at the histories of of Russia or Soviet Union and the U.S., there really is no shining <laughs> knight in the shining armor here. Both have uh, both have pursued. Uh, pretty ruthlessly their their own geopolitical aims and and uh, th there's kind of a complete switch over which has happened now it is from a um, uh, from a neutral state uh, close to Russia and now we are like a vassal state of the United States but it's been a gradual progress after the breakup of the Soviet Union in, in uh, 1991 and but it has been pushed uh, behind the surface and the most crucial things are that we were not asked, Finnish people were not asked 
do we want to join the NATO? And we had no say on the DCA agreement. So this is one of those things that has been just just driven by the Finnish elite and and, and uh, Kokomus party. But it's a uh, it's 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 a really strange shift, which I think we can yeah it, we need to go further back in history to get a really really good angle of of what's going on here. But it's it's a uh, it, it's a it's a it's of course a big cataclysmic change. But the most important thing is that we the Finnish people were not asked. The the surprising thing though is now the this treaty of course like any treaty has to be ratified. Mm. It was ratified by Parliament unanimously. There was no vote mm. against it. Um, yeah. And the, can you? How big is your parliament? How many people sit there? Two hundred. The same number, like uh, as in Switzerland. I mean, in that this kind of numbers, you would expect that at least some voices would be against this. Um, how how do you explain to yourself that even among the legislative, this seems to be a, a done deal? I think we have had a. a, a coup of sort during the corona times the, at that point everything everything that basically that the most of the things that the government cooked up with all lockdowns and all that all those there, there was close uh 100 um uh support for all these actions in our parliament and this is completely unheard of so it seems that the corona times ended our opposition here mm. and the power was transferred to some groups i have uh, a, a senior member of our ministry of health told me in in february 21 that all the instructions how to handle the corona crisis uh, are were coming from um uh, an outside source, so outside Finland, and he he actually demanded that our then Prime Minister Sanna Marin would be put in a trial for high treason. And so there is a there is this thing that the Corona actions, the people were never asked what we want to be done, and the same is with NATO. So it seems that we have some, we have a coup of the elite here in Finland in progress, where the most important things happening to our country are not uh, put in a, in a kind of direct democratic uh, assessment. But it's just it's just, just been pushed through. And in that process, the whole concept of opposition has just vanished. And the most kind of proper, uh, I, I think the most worrying thing is that at current time, this seems to be perfectly fine for most of the Finns, that we don't have an opposition anymore. If you don't have an opposition in your parliament, you don't have a democracy anymore. It's gone. Because it's it's completely certain that there is a, a, a now or again a growing percentage of Finnish people who would like NATO to go to leave, or Finland leave NATO, who would have not had who would have completely objected of the DCA agreement I but we're not asked I, I I take it from your tweets and from this one that you belong to that group who is who's very unhappy about this about this development because as you laid out in your tweets you went from being a perfectly safe neutral country to now being a front state in a potential war NATO to Russia right I mean if yeah. there is a NATO Russia war now Finland has to be has to be attacked by Russia. There's just no way that yeah. you can avoid that, right? This now makes Finland a front state, just like Sweden as well. Um, the uh, let me uh, yeah, let, can I can I say one? This, this, is a, this is an important point which you said that because actually I haven't read the agreement. Like I said, I had two I had had two busy weeks, so you know more about the actual specific of the ECA. But the thing is that if they can, then this are, this I also read from Finnish media that the US can now place to these uh, um, uh, bases they have, they can import anything they want there, which I think includes also nuclear weapons. So if if that would come to be, we have like, there's 200 kilometers from our border, little less, to St. Petersburg. 
if you bring a medium range missiles here um nuclear bombs you're gonna you which you can drop from f-16 on f-18s there is there is no nuclear deterrence on the side of russia in the sense that they cannot you know uh, um, um intercept those missiles so their whole policy of nuclear deterrence fails it, it would be like something like someone bringing nuclear weapons on of the coast of um of um close very close to washington dc yeah in virginia basically yeah. there and what would you think yeah what would you think if if, the, if such, such action is taken russia is forced to react yes yes and they can only like react with a a, a surgical strike or a tactical nuclear strike so finland is not a st <clears throat> front line front uh, line state anymore we're actually the main target of Russian attacks on NATO. We have we have made ourselves a bullseye. Yes, yes. yes. It's the stupidest yes. thing. It's the stupidest thing this country has ever done. I, I it's very sad to say, but I think Finland now has the potential to become a next Ukraine, uh, although within NATO. No, this I must take this back. Mm. You know, you are a NATO member, so whatever whoever attacks you, that will trigger Article Five. So there's a different. It's a mm. it's a different scenario. But in terms of, but, uh, can, I, can I stop here? You, what is Article Five? Actually? Yeah, you're right. It, it, it's not an all-out defense. It, it just says that with the, with, um, with the limits of their powers, basically, other countries need to support yes, Finland. Yes. In, in that case, Article 5. Yes. The, it's basically the same thing as with Ukraine. Yes. But now, in Europe, there are no weapons to send anymore. So we would be our own. Uh, I, don't, I don't like... Some people... Like uh, uh, you know, the Article Five is something something like a whole account to them that it's it's something sacred that will uh, secure you from all. That is not the case in Article Five. And actually, in in 2013 and 2022, in March 2022, Kremlin or Putin showed his plan uh, of of uh, military actions in. Nordics, if he would, if, if there would be a war between NATO and Russia, there were two nuclear bombing runs to Stockholm, which is the capital of Sweden, and and the, and the uh, the second one they actually flew 50 kilometers inside the bombers and the uh, fighter jets escorting them 50 kilometers inside, like uh, Swedish territorial waters, and then they were just able to do some kind of. Uh, um, uh, uh, response, then turn back. But if there is, if there is a war between uh, Russia and NATO, they will. Russia will take Gotland, which is the biggest island in the in the middle of the Baltic Sea, and they'll drop a nuclear bomb to Stockholm. If you decapitalize our most important like city, Stockholm, you you cripple the whole defenses of Nordics basically and then when you take Gotland you control Bell Baltic Sea and we Finland does not have another access basically to to uh to outer territorial waters in that case we've been forced to negotiate with Russia because all our imports for imports and exports from outside world will be cut basically no it's it's a, so it, 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 it's a it's a, so let me let me just finish let me just finish so we are an island. Finland is an island, and if such a scenario comes, I think Finland has no has just two options: face complete annihil an annihilation, or surren surrender to Russia, which also means that NATO will break at the same time. So, Finland is both the strongest in military sense and weakest in strategic sense link in NATO. I don't think. I'm, I'm not sure that the leaders of NATO even think this true when they took Finland in, because they have, Kremlin surely does have a play in Nordics. And in 2013 and 2022, Putin showed us what it is. And when I understood it, I was just, okay, we're completely screwed. NATO or not, we're screwed. 
if we if we if we if we would not be NATO, and there would be a NATO uh, Russia war, we could negotiate and remain neutral in 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 this corner. And now we cannot. So it's very it's very likely that Finland has just signed its own death uh, uh, certificate or death penalty or whatever. So you know. Okay, yeah. but that that's something I needed to t- needed to needed to tell you. No, I, I I I agree with you. Like in terms of military strategy, the this is an all or nothing strategy for Finland. This is like either this is gonna work and keep the peace, or if the peace breaks, then we are dead. <laughs> and Finland yeah. is for sure gonna be dead. Yeah. You know, Germany, France, the UK, they might survive depending on how things go, but Finland will for sure be dead. Right? This is it. It's just like yeah, yeah. we will be. We're wiped out. Uh, So that's why uh, transformation from a neutral state into a potential front front wall state, and that's that's something uh, that may is very hard for me to understand how this is goes unanimously down. And of course, um, the argument here could be that oh, if it was unanimous and if there's no opposition and if this uh, there's no protests in the street, this means Finnish people are in general fine with it. Uh, This is. It is what it is, and this is the new strategy of Finland. So there is there a good reason to believe that had the people been asked, had this been a referendum, the way that in Switzerland it would have to be a referendum, that things might have gone another way? Well, I would say that even with the referendum, we would have accepted the NATO membership. But I don't, I, because I, I, there would be, there was no discussion on NATO membership, basically, in, in Finnish media. But there would have been a an, an very, like, wide uh, and, and, and throughout discussion, what the, what does this mean for Finland? And signing of the DC agreement after that would not have been easy, I would say, because Finnish people would have understood what they understand now. Most of them have started to wake up that no, no, actually NATO can lead to a war. Because our media is, comp- is is war propaganda completely, and and preparation of Finnish people to war. This is this is what has been going on for two months now, nonstop. And so many Finns are not stupid in that sense; they are just utterly naive. So they have started to wake up, w- wake up to this threat of war. Can you can you expand on that a little bit? Like, what is me Finnish media like at the moment? What is the current discourse? What are you being bombarded with? What the most telling examples are telling people where to go uh, to shelter when uh, when the war comes. When? Not if. I have never in my life. Yeah, yeah. Where are the shelters? Where should you locate within Finland? Where the people in Finland are likely to be moved when the war comes or if the war comes? So they are giving the instructions like where would Finnish people be ev- evacuated in a case of war? That's like completely unheard of. My grandparents were, um, they were refugees from, uh, uh, from our eastern border. So I heard this same talk from them, like before they actually, actually happened, that they were informed, okay, do you need to move? And now, 80 years later, 80 plus years later, we're in the same situation. When I saw this, it was about a month ago. A few weeks ago, I actually posted on Max. When I see, saw this headline poster, I was like, "Okay, now we know where we're going." <laughs> and like in and 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 during the during the two past two years, I think according to our media, Putin should have died something like twelve times at least. You know, he's mortally ill and all that. You know, and Russia has been losing all the time in Ukraine, and now suddenly we're out of weapons, and Russia is threat to whole Europe. So it's been, we've been under under constant propaganda since uh, February 22. But only during the past two months, there has been a, a switch over for preparation of Finnish people to the uh, outcome of, of, of war. That there will be actual, the Finland will be a war. And just, yeah, uh, during the signing of the um, of the DC on the same day, a uh, member of parliament and the worst military analyst and forecaster of our history, Pekka Kovare, told publicly that Finland is already at war. So these are all signs 
which are or messages that are used to prepare Finland for the eventuality that there will be a war against Russia. Is... But Finnish people are not, are not many are not buying this. Especially the young guys are like, we, we are not going <laughs> to the front. No one is saying that you need to go to the front yet. But I'm suspecting it, it will start, such, such speech will start, or speak will start by the end of the end of summer, early fall. Does does fin Finland have mandatory uh, conscription, or is it a? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, a military service. We all have to go. I, I was actually a, a group leader in the um, arm um, uh, uh, engineer company of of a uh, armored brigade brigade, but I resigned from the military in, in September because I I will I would I would have gladly defended Finland. But I will not participate in in NATO wars. This... But we have every Finnish guy is is uh, can be conscripted in a sense that we are all we have all received training already. You know this with, uh, and I know you're an economist by training and not 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 that much in in IR. But I I, I cannot wrap my head around this crisis of realism in Europe because the whole realist framework is based upon. Uh, the idea that countries and leaders of countries take decisions that are in the interest, in the national interest, that national interest overrides everything else and security and so on are in there, but there's something else. And this seems to me so clearly, plainly, basically suicidal and willing to go to war for NATO, for the United States, and maybe for the good cause, I don't know. But this seems to be the mm. same thinking, and it's all over Europe, including Switzerland and so on, this idea that we now have to defend liberal democracy against evil autocracy and you know everybody now has to march in lockstep and this is so clearly mm -hmm. against national interests at least in my eyes and probably also in your eyes that how are mm -hmm. you it, is it really just this fear of russia it was this moment 2022 24th of february so shocking to the finnish soul that it basically threw out uh realist thinking of action reaction models it was actually, but it lasted, I don't know, maybe three months. But it, it was a shocker, really, because no one expected that there, there will be a, an, another war of invasion mm -hmm. in Europe. So it, I, I would say that the, at that point, the support of NATO was something, could be something like 70%. Gallups or Paul said that it was 80%, but I don't buy that. 60-70 is more close. And like people... Like my, my both of my families are from um, uh, well in the eastern border, border and one from the Karelian Peninsula, and they are uh, we are, so Ru Russians like we, like we usually understand the Russian mindset and how Russian power politics goes, but people in the West tend not to. They 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 see Russia as the big boogeyman or you know something like that, and. And generally, there has been like a, a long-standing understand, uh, long-standing understanding of Russian geopolitics, Russian aims, Russian culture, Russian psyche, Russian soul, in the Finnish political system. And for some reason, I think quite deliberately, it was thrown out in in twenty two. But we have to understand that it was not just the Russian uh, starting the invasion of Ukraine, but we were also bombarded with never before seen uh, propaganda campaign. Or oh, let me correct, we, we had similar in the 1939 and 1940s. But after that, there was massive propaganda campaign, you know, analysts were going on TV and saying all these things that how Russia has become a threat and how this and this happens and all that. So Finnish were bombarded. Uh, heavily in the media, media to 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 get them accept in some some sense this NATO membership. Can you explain? So it was a, it, it took me six months to understand that we are under war, war propaganda. The kind of the idea of Finnish media presenting at least some like ob objective views and not going full propaganda was so thick. Even in me, it took six months to understand it. Yeah, you know. So, 
at the at, at this point at this point i do believe that we are beyond the moment when we can still i mean we can probably still convince a good part of of our population at home but probably not enough it's probably more important that we explain this european ma mania to the russians and to the outside world just to explain from uh, from europe like look why we are going suicidal why we are going uh, why we are going yeah. crazy um how do you can you when you when you understood that this propaganda is so thick when you when you got to that and mm. and since do you have an explanation for how it is possible that these media institutions seem so captured is it something genuine that that is that probably has to do with the way how these people select themselves or do you see any influences from like us think tanks or transatlantic networks also playing part in that well Uh, in 1994, we voted for the membership of the European Union. And then mm, one of the, uh, uh, I think it was 2005, uh, um, 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 how, um, the managing editor of a, uh, one of the largest newspapers, Ilta Lehti, um, uh, Pekka Karohvaro was the name, I think, he retired. And when he was asked, what do you regret? He said that the 94 decision uh, by uh, the, he was a um, owner of, of uh, Helsingin Sanomat Aalto Serkko, who gathered all the editors uh, together and they agreed that they all will be for European Union, joining Finland, joining European Union, and he basically said that at that point the uh, the object, objectivity or you know, Finnish media died. Mm. And I think after that point, there have been some part of our elite who has a very strong grip on Finnish media. So they can basically tell them what to write. And from where do they get their instructions? Well, but probably from the global elite, uh, and which probably includes the US. But we have had this, like, it's the strangest thing that our media was more free <laughs> when the Soviet Union was right next to us than it is now. And there's actually one researcher of, of a uh, Finnish governing policies or, or parliament who told me, professor told me some years back that when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was a, a, a true panic among the civil servants of uh, high civil servants of Finland that from where do we take our orders now? You know, when Soviet Union collapsed and you, you, you didn't need to take orders from Kremlin anymore. Then fortunately came to the EU. So we changed Kremlin to Brussels. And so Finnish civil servants, it, 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 it was not a joke when he told me that, that, you know, it's just, Finnish civil servants seem to be like you, they need to get instructions from somewhere. And for some reason, Finnish people in power have so low, so low, so, so low self-esteem that they, they need to get their instructions from somewhere. So there is a uh, like Finnish people are proud of our nation, of our history or that. But our leaders are just complete sacks of love. So they, they, I, I don't know what it is. But you have one of the greatest, greatest geo strategists and greatest political leaders of the 20th century that is Finnish, Uro Kekkonen. And I know he's not widely yes. famous all over the world, but he ought to be because he and the, his predecessor as well, as actually, and I always mispronounce his name. Pa, pa, pa. Juho Kusti Paasikivi. Juho Kusti Paasikivi, yeah. These two, yeah. I mean, both of them were responsible. But uh, that... The first one for getting an agreement with the Soviet Union that let them out of the Warsaw Pact. Finland was not forced to become yeah. a Soviet Pact member, uh, a Warsaw Pact member, but it had to sign an agreement which basically made sure that that Finland would be a buffer and would guard the Soviet Union. The whole deal was that if somebody mm. tries to attack the Soviet Union through Finland, then Finland has to help the Soviet Union in repelling the attack. 
So basically, that was the deal. Ba no, no. Basically, it said that we will defend ourselves as an independent yes, yes, country. Yes, yes, so, yes. So against yeah, and, and Soviet Union can provide assistance. Uh, the Soviet Union has the right to yeah. ask for consultations in order to jointly yeah. do things. So basically, I mean, yeah. to the Russians, it's very, it's a very simple deal. Okay, pretend that you do this on your own, but actually, we know that mm. you will, you will make sure, and we, if something happens, then we just help mm. you because you will be attacked anyhow, right, and, and repel. Very simple. Yeah. And then... This agreement but, uh, made sure that you didn't have to join the, join the Warsaw Pact, that, that Finland was neutral, yeah, yeah. and then uh, Mr. Uro Kekkonen managed to actually play that out very well and always make sure, but always make sure that the Soviet Union is not threatened because that kept mm. Finland safe as well. And it worked like a charm. You had, you had yeah. a Western liberal um, economy, market economy, beautiful development mm. model and everything was stable in the region <laughs> and he, he did that yeah, against, was good, that. against the, what the soviet union yeah, yeah. wanted and also against what the west wanted so a very independent foreign policy actually and, yeah yeah we, we were in the middle we were we had like they were like um what what, what was the term actually um uh they, they both sides were trying to mm -hmm. get us in in the marriage yeah so we could bribe from both sides. Like with the Soviet Union, they had a, uh, uh, they were under um, a trade embargo from many, uh, many Western states. So they really liked to, you know, do business with the Finns. And we just ripped them off on everything. We, we, we made massive, of course, we provided good products and they love it. But we just, we had so much negotiating power. We ripped them off. It was, it was the best deal like ever made in the in the whole history of the world uh, on, on on trade it's it, it is really great and only thing what was required that we had a uh, certain limitation of you know tanks and military power and all that but like i was in the armored brigade and of course uh, us in the in the leadership we were told different things that not the usual you know servicemen that do here and for example i think we had there was a, st a statement that we we have T seventy two ten tanks. Then I think they were like we could have two hundred and fifty something intact tanks. There was a rumor that where where, where served there is a, a underground base nearby that there were hundreds of T seventy tanks with their turrets off. <laughs> So they, they they fall off. They, they didn't they didn't go in the agreement. They, they, they were turrets off. So. They're not intact. <laughs> they're not yeah, functional. They're not yeah, yeah, they're not intact. So that was the thing. And Finland played this game so marvelously over the years. And in, in and, and there was all these kind of threats uh, over, over the over those many years. But Gekkonen and he just we just mingled along. Yeah, and the, the... and the, like you, like I mentioned, but the strangest thing, if you look at the UUA shopping which is um just you know that we we made in um, fifty well early early fifties, was it? And they um so and now the DCA we had more freedom in the UUA than with the DCA now. Yeah. Soviet Soviet Union could not walk here with the weapons. You know, we, they didn't have, they have some rental bases in Hungary and all that for for uh, some time. But they just, they just couldn't trespass the Finnish independence and, uh, you know, walk over it. Or sovereignty, they couldn't walk over it. Now with the DCA, US can. How, how, how can this be? How can we be, this is just, it makes absolutely the, no sense. The U US service personnel, it makes no sense. US service personnel can now go to Finland, go to any Finnish shop, buy anything, keep the receipt, and then at the end of the month, just ask the VAT back. <laughs> they get, they, yeah. they, they don't even leave VAT in, uh, in, in, in your country. And the, yeah. um, it's a joke. It's a sick it's show. Just, sick show. And economically, I don't see a benefit either. I mean, in the in the Cold War, you know, as you just said, this was also economically a benefit. The only other country that had a similar deal that was able to access both markets was the Yugoslavia. And they were able to import mm. really awesome tractors from Belarus. And they were imp able to mm. import Fiat uh, components for their Zastava cars and and, and, and develop mm. that. And and but this is this is gone. I mean, there's no nothing left of this. And there's also nothing left of this idea of having an independent foreign policy right as you just said now finland is clearly willing to be the spear tip to nato 
apparently. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I have to make one personal notion. You said great tractors from Belarus. I actually, the farm of my grandparents, there were a, a long time, there was one tractor in Belarus, which was the, one of the most horrible machines ever. It was completely useless piece of crap. But well, it worked. It did the, did the things, but it was nothing good. So I, I, have, okay, my... I, I have driven it so many times on the field and on. The, so it, it's a horrible piece of machinery. Okay. But okay. Let's leave it. Okay. I, I, I'm happy because my friend in Herzegovina, his, uh, her grandfather, her grandfather told me we love this tractor because it was basically indestructible. It would, it would, it would go okay, anywhere. Okay, that's true. <laughs> it would break, but it would go okay, anywhere. That's, that's true. That's true. It was a, hor it was a horrible thing to work with, but you could fix it till the end of times. Time. <laughs> so it, it was in the indestructible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just, okay. That's a good point. I, I wouldn't just you know farm machinery. I would not give high points to that, but uh, but. If you are in a country where you cannot get like spare parts all the time, then it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But in fact, okay, but okay. Enough of the tractors, in, maybe. In, but in, just in, yeah, sure. enough. Enough of tractors. Let's let's get back on track and try to uh, mm. uh, speak again or explain again to maybe let's say if you if you had to to talk to the Russians, <laughs> how would you tell them? what is happening in Finland and how whether you see any chances for amelioration again because this was really I mean how does Europe fix its relationship with Russia without going to war it's at I think we are at the point where this is a serious issue do you think that this can be fixed over time this agreement the stationing agreement is valid for 10 years after 10 years it can be it can mm. be uh, terminated yeah. within a, a year yeah 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 well, I hope that happens, but there. let's remember there's a lot of like Russians living here. I think like 80,000 or something, I, I don't, and I, I know a few of them. So I think especially the, um, the middle class of Russia, they understand what is going on in Europe. They are not stupid like, and, and Russians are, they have been under propaganda for decades during the Soviet Union. And they have been under propaganda since, I don't know, maybe 2006 or heavier propaganda or something like 2006 or something. I talked to one Russian uh, specialist here who explained it. So they understand mm, what propaganda does to people. So I, I think I think there is a, uh, there's an understanding what is happening in Finland at least and, and, in, and in Europe in general. And what I heard from there just a month ago uh, that generally the, the mood is good in Russia. They are saddened what is happening and hope that this conflict conflict will pass soon. And that's how it goes. And 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 Kremlin is slowly building at the, as uh, it as a military economy. But that's the view. Like modern Russians are not like the ones who lived in Soviet Union because you couldn't leave Soviet Union. Mm. And when they, when the people were allowed to leave Soviet Union to visit, then the collapse of the Soviet Union began. Russian or modern Russian, especially the middle classes, they are not like all Europeans, like they, they, they go around, not cosmopolitan, but they travel, they see in the world. So they cannot be controlled uh, and see in a similar fashion uh, than the people who lived in Soviet Union. But what is worrying that I hear is that, like Putin has been telling Russians that NATO is a threat. And and recently, it seems that they, ordinary Russians are starting to believe that. <laughs> uh, but also I'm starting to believe that, so I just, <laughs> so that's how it goes. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a worrying development in a sense that it can lead to a general support uh, to operations against NATO in, 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 in the Russian mindset. So, and this is how you build a, uh, a, 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 a support for yeah. war. And it's, it has, yeah, so Kremlin do, does it, it's a, a more, it's more kind of a self um, protective measure. Yeah. They build it for, because I don't think they, I don't, I don't think for a second that Kremlin wants a war against NATO. No. But in in NATO, it's building offensive capacity, no. the, which is completely different. The yeah. biggest danger we are running that is 
and in in Ukraine, Ukraine already has the worst case scenario. It is the battleground of yeah. a proxy war. I mean, for Ukrainians and Ukraine, this is the worst of all possible worlds. But the rest of Europe, and I include Russia, it, the danger we are running is that we get into a spiral of mutual uh, reassurance that the other one is an enemy. The more you make the you make sure that you at home believe that the other one is an enemy and and, and the same happens here, you yep. get to the conclusion that war is inevitable. And the moment enough on no. both sides believe it, the question becomes who who will judge that attacking first is in my interest. And we are not no. there yet. I think the Russians are very much on, no. on board with, no, we need to avoid this. But if we get out of that, and yeah. we know that Vladimir Putin, I mean, in, in Europe and in the West, is, is being portrayed as the greatest warmonger that ever, has ever walked the earth since Adolf mm -hmm. Hitler. But in Russia, he mm -hmm. is criticized for being not forceful enough, for being for being mm -hmm. too restrained. That's so true. there's people who want to lift the restraint. And the more pressure the, the Euro Europeans put with these bases and so on, the more, fire, the more mm -hmm. arguments these people will have to say like look we need to escalate yeah 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 and and let let's just think that when when did this happen the last time in europe that we de demonized a nation in europe yeah when was it 1930s yeah. in nazi germany and this is the same thing that demonization of, of ordinary russians which is completely bollocks insane things but that is happening here but yeah so um uh, yeah, the worry is that if we get to the point where the war is acceptable in ordinary people's minds, then it happens. Yes. And we're not there yet, like you said, and I, I don't I don't I hope to see that we do not get there. Uh, and but, you know, we yeah, it's uh, yeah, OK. No, no, we are. We are. <laughs> I, I, we need. That's why I say we need to get out of this spiral of death. And we are still spiraling towards yeah. a fifth general European war in in 400 years, yeah. the fifth time. And the, yeah. the question for me is, like, what can we as civil society do? That's why I would like to know from you. Um, is there a mood among uh, the, the Finns that you interact with to say, like, at some point it has to stop? Are there any groupings? Are there any, maybe not political parties, but even just like civil society organizations that are not on board with the messaging and that are starting to push back? Yeah, it's happening like uh, under the surface. We don't have any any movement yet, but ordinary people to whom I talk to, young or old, there is a change in the mood. I just, I'm not just certain that's it's fast enough. Mm. So it is it, it, it not developing fast enough. I think it's going too slow because we have this trust on this uh, media and, and our government, which is completely the, we shouldn't have that. The, it's unfounded. The, there was this bellwether test just recently in Europe with the EU parliament elections. And in a lot of countries, you could see how the centrist parties, the pro-war parties actually lost some support. Not enough, but they lost mm. to the, the fringes, which are funnily both, especially in Germany, both of the fringe parties are anti-war um, in, in, in Ukraine. Mm. Uh, how was it in Finland, uh, the outcome? What does it indicate for who's getting more popular and who less? Well, we, the, the, nothing happened here. No, nothing happened here, which is, yeah, nothing. I don't know. You know, it's just, just as usual. So we didn't have any major shifts. And I think the problem is that there is no place to shift. Mm. There is no opposition. here. So where do you go? You don't go anywhere. So I, my point was, do not vote. That was my argument. Do not vote because there is no point of voting. Our president elections, there were like, was that eight candidates? It was like the good old days of the Soviet Union when there were these leaders. They were so gray. All of them were so gray. They they, they took the, they were they were not. There, for example, was not a single candidate for peace in Finland. Completely unheard of. And they were just given. Everybody was given one topic that this is how you differ from the others. It was a uh, straight, complete straight. I talked to young guys and he, they said that we don't vote, they, they are all the same. And this has really not happened in Finland uh, in any time in our 107 year of independence. So that it's just there's something so seriously broken in this country that it's it's un, uncomprehensible. But it's just it just will take more time for the Finns to wake up. And I worry that it will not happen fully. 
before the first bomb or missile drops to our soil. And then it starts. But I, I hope I'm wrong. I, I hope I hope you're wrong too. I hope that I hope that at some point naked fear will take over and and actually yes. but uh, it seems that uh, but let me let me yeah let me, this one thing I, I this is this is crucially important when we fight the when we fight the russians in 39 and, and uh, 3140 and 4144 we eventually lost 12 percent of our land mass whole Karelian peninsula which is close to saint petersburg everything was gone but the Finnish people did not think that this was a, a, a catastrophic loss because at the point at the end of like in um, in February uh, 40 uh, and in May, June, no, well, anyway, 44 uh, in, in summer, there was a point where the all front lines were collapsing. And if that would have happened, we had had mass casualties, uh, we have lost most of the Finnish land, basically, and our society, our economy would not be able to recover. And, that, and at, the, at that point, our Finnish leader said, okay, it's enough. We take the herd, but we uh, survive as a sovereign nation. Mm. Unfortunately, at this point, gone and went with Ukraine. We sacrificed, it's, it's a failed state, we sacrificed we sacrificed Ukrainians for a cause which I cannot understand. But the point is that we had two bloody wars with Russians and then 80 years of prosperous uh, uh, coexistence. 80 years. Really, yeah, with, well, with a um, uh, little over 50 years with the, uh, the, the second greatest superpower in the world, the Soviet Union. And people said, you cannot make agreements with Russia. Bullshit. You cannot live in peace with Russia. Bullshit. You cannot live in prosperous relationship with Russia. Bullshit. Finnish example tells them all. Now, unfortunately, we gave it away. And that makes us the stupid nation alive. But sometimes you have to be stupid to get wise again, I guess. But our example from the from the Second World War till today, shows how you perceive and thrive alongside a, a kind of a geopolitical monster that Russia and the US are. So, yeah. And, and you don't do it by making yourself the spear tip of the of the other one. Uh, this is the most no. you know. I think the biggest victory of the United States in geopolitics. They never won on the battlefield because there they keep losing, but they won them actually in the brains and the minds of people. Mm. This is, mm. the, I, I think this is the unprecedented moment. We have never had a point in time where as one great power was able, not by way of, of, of guns and so on, to, to, to take over land, but ideologically to capture other entire nations and make them work like fall in line like a clockwork and wanting to do mm. that that is mm. fascinating and a win that we must attribute to the i think to the us that this, the soviet union russia china they never managed i mean they're not even close <laughs> they're not even close at inspiring that much awe and love and admiration to the point where other nations are willing to give up themselves for mm. the greater good of what's coming from from here. Um, it is uh, I have a question. Have, have you lived in the US? No, I visited four times for conferences, but I never wanted to stay because I felt unsafe. Well, I, OK, well, I lived, for example, and, and six, six months in Manhattan in mm -hmm. 2010, one of the greatest uh, times of my life. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the U.S. people and the mood there is really exhilarating, really supportive, really like something different. Oh, it, it has now a bit changed after the corona, something broke. But in general, the, the, 
the American ideal, the dream, is still alive um, um, among the minds of people. And that what carries it. The problem is that the government has corrupted the idea or turn it or you uh, or is using it mm -hmm. to kind of bring the box um, or the peace of the US across the world with different military operations bringing chaos. So everybody wants the ideal that the US is was and still is, which lives in the in the minds and hearts of the US citizens. But they are given this corrupted version through Pentagon, to Washington, to to the White House, which is not what they are looking for. But they have they they sell the dream like, you know, they're the snake oil salesman. The U.S. government. This is what you get. It will cure all your problems, fix your economy, fix your people. Then you drink it, and it's it's some black liquid that makes you sick. And then you have military bases on your on your country, and you are wondering when are the Russians going to strike. So it's a perfectly executed marketing and propaganda operation on the behalf of the U.S. government. But the U.S., the idea of the United States, how it is the freedom, liberty, and all that, it's, it's so supportive. It, it, it's so, uh, we, uh, not so supportive, but it's, it's something we need to try for. And I hope that the battle for the U.S. soul, it's already ongoing, but I, I hope it begins again in, in, in November. Because we need the U.S. to stand as a beacon of this ideal of freedom. Or otherwise, I think we fail. But you mean the real version, not the fake version, right? The... Yeah, yeah, the real version, not the, and... not the one who with, with the pamphlets and, you know, the, not the propaganda and the marketing version, but the real version. Yeah, and, the, and funnily so enough, you know, uh... that real version of the US before the Second World War was one which said we are not going to get involved in European uh, uh, stupid yeah. warfare. We're going to do our own thing. Yeah. And they that that went out in, in 41 when this country where I'm in right now bombed them out of 150 years of neutrality. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And there's a lot of like speculation of how much did the White House know on the attack of Pearl Harbor and all that. It, so. it's, it's utterly clear that they were expecting an attack. The surprise was that it yeah. was Pearl Harbor. They expected it to be the Philippines. That's where they did the preparation. Oh, Pearl okay. Harbor oh, yeah. was yeah. The, yeah. The, the, the place was the surprise, not the attack. It was utterly yeah. clear from yeah. the two weeks preceding. Um, and, you know, the, 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 Japan, anyway, the, Japanese, yeah. <laughs> the Japanese were begging for a bone. They had two ambassadors in Washington, two, the regular one and an, uh, an extraordinary one who was there just to try to mend fences. And what the government in Tokyo wanted is a bone from the U.S. so that they could pacify their own militarists because they didn't have them under control uh -huh. and the bone never came. So they in the end, the militarists said we have to go. And then the, the government signed off on it. Um, uh, OK, that's okay. why like, uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't know that. Uh, no, it's, it's just like, I think we are unfortunately in a situation where these states, the way that they behave, you know, we are in very, very negative spiral and I am very worried about Finland. So I would hope that 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 Finland snaps out of it at some point. Uh, but you're seeing even on the political scene, there's not nobody on the horizon. There's no no figure that could. No, I think it will start. If, if if it starts, I hope it. I hope it will start. It it will start with something like a grassroots revolution in Finland. The thing with the Finnish people is that, like friends, they, well, they riot. Mm. That's what they do. The Finnish people is that when they're pushed, they succumb. They succumb. They succumb. But then there comes a point when they said enough. And then things start to happen. So I'm expecting that we will, within the five years, maybe I hope, we will see a lot of like middle-aged guys with baseball bats walking on our uh, Mannerheim Street towards the Parliament House to say the say to the corrupt politicians that now it's we're done. The Finnish we carry like the uh, idea of, of of do not mess with us. Mm mess with our families. So it's it's deep in the psyche of, of Finnish men, for example. But it has just been put to sleep. But it's there. And we don't even have to go actual rioting to get it out. If just Finnish men just would say that now, 
this this ends now. I think our politicians would end it. Mm. So that is my hope. Like uh, my, I I put my hope to the good people of France and also the good people of of Finland, uh, the men of Finland. At some point, which is not too far, they will become a turning point. They said this is enough now. I hope I'm 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 optimistic on those things coming. And the friends, they they I think they are already starting it. I think so too. It seems. I think There's, so too. Yeah. Let's let's see how the elections go on, on Sunday. How the how they spin it. But yeah. Let's let's end it on this optimistic note, where we are hoping that we can avert the third world war. Uh, Tuomas Malinen, uh, where should people follow you? Is Twitter the best place to follow you? Do you publish somewhere else? Anything? Yeah, X, and then I have a newsletter in Substack. You can just find it googling Thomas Malinen's forecasting newsletter. And I urge also you to check GNS Economics newsletter if you are really interested in 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 in-depth analysis. So we publish a lot of stuff there. Yeah, and you've you've heard uh, Thomas. I mean, he uh, he he says it how it is. <laughs> he doesn't mince his words. And I thank you very much for that. This was very very thank insightful you. to me, uh, Thomas Malinen. Thank you. Thank you.